Hi, welcome to Julia Programming for Nervous Beginners. This is lesson zero, so this is about preparation to do the course and deciding whether or not to do the course. Our aims are just uh, quite simple. We want to give you the approach and the outline, and of course we want to talk a little bit about the target audience for this course. Um, and in order for you to decide about uh, to do this course, you really need to know whether you have the minimum computer competence. Um, we can also give you some advice about how to do this course. So after this lesson, you will be able to decide whether or not to start doing this course and to ensure that you have the minimum competence needed. So we'll spend a little time on the minimum competence. You might already know that you have the minimum competence and you can just skip uh, that aspect of this lesson. Okay, so our target audience are people with no program experience whatsoever. We also want it to be accessible to people who are somewhat unsure about whether programming is for them. Uh, they may feel a bit intimidated by computers or they may have lost confidence during a first course on programming. And we believe that we have a slightly different way of doing things and that uh, the course may be a bit more acceptable if you not quite sure about computers. So our philosophy can be summed up in the slogan, take small steps, leave no gaps, and everything makes sense. So what we believe is that programming is as easy, but no easier than learning a new language. So it's hard for some, but it's possible for everybody, with some very few exceptions. It takes some effort and persistence, um, but that is all. It's not actually that hard intrinsically. And of course, some will find it easier, some will find it harder, some will take faster, some will take slower. So what? So let us uh, expand on the slogan, small steps, no gaps, make sense. Okay, so of course, one should take small steps with beginners. And this may make it a bit boring for people who already know how to program but this course is not aimed at them. It may also be a little bit frustrating for people who are interested in the more advanced features of Julia, and this course is not for them either. So what does leave no gaps mean? Let us start by saying that in many courses, and not only in programming, learners are expected to fill the gaps. And in fact, that is what normally happens. Even you, when you learn to speak, you did a lot of filling in. Gaps are not in themselves a bad thing, but they can get in the way sometimes, especially for learners who are a bit unsure of themselves. And this is particularly true for learning computer languages because they have such rigid rules. So our solution to this problem has two parts. We devote a whole lesson, which is lesson four of week one, to explaining why the rules have to be so rigid and what it really means for the rules of a computer language to be rigid. And secondly, we try to ex make sure that we explain everything, that we leave no gaps. So there is nothing that is not being addressed by some explanation in your understanding of a particular topic. And this also feeds into the idea that everything should make sense. Uh, this, of course, is self-explanatory. The sad thing is that we can be much less sure about making sense than we can about leaving no gaps. And so we would like feedback from you to let us know uh, how and where we fail to make sense. Okay, so if we have a short course and it leaves no gaps, how can we possibly hope to cover the whole language? And we, obviously we can't. So we leave out a lot that is very special about the Julian language and makes it attractive to professionals. On the other hand, we are aiming at beginners that most programming courses ignore. And so we don't actually give numerical examples, which is very common in uh, computing courses. Instead, we focus on text. It turns out that we can use text to make examples of almost anything, the exception, of course, being the little bit of elementary arithmetic, which we certainly should tell you how to do in case you do want to do it. Um, so what it means is that when we discuss a topic, we have to give a complete discussion, no gaps and everything makes sense. And so it has to be only of a part of the topic. Each topic is a big thing in itself. 
And so we will just do a small introductory part, and the rest of the topic is for later on when you extend your knowledge in Julia. For instance, types and scope, and you will learn later how to, uh, what that really means. And we discuss them more fully than is usual because they are necessary to, when we want to leave no gaps. Uh, we only do as much as you need, and with perhaps one exception, these topics are not in themselves at all difficult. Okay, so programming is not difficult, but it can feel strange. And that is because of the dominant ro role of formal logic. There's no way around this. The only thing you can do is to get used to it. It may never stop feeling strange. But as long as you know where it is coming from, you can do more than getting used to it. You can use it effectively. So that's what our aim is for you to get to use Julia effectively. Okay, so this is uh, for people who really are not sure whether they know enough uh, of computer language to do this course. And there are only three items that are at minimum. You need to know about folders and subfolders and be able to create them, be able to move them around, move one folder into another folder, and also to move files from one folder to another folder. That's it. That's all you need to know about folders and subfolders. As far as files goes, the only thing that is special is that you must be able to save a plain text file. And the third thing, of course, is that you must have a Julia REPL that you can launch on your computer. So you have to have Julia installed and so on. We don't cover how to do that. Um, we assume that that has been done either by you or by somebody who's done it for you. Okay, so the first one, which is the folders and subfolders, are probably the one that will cause most problems. So let's start with that. So you will use a file manager, and Apple, iOS, Microsoft Windows, various flavors of Linux, they all have their own file managers. They have the standard one that comes with the operating system, and then they probably have a few more that you could use if you wanted to. So they differ a lot from each other, but luckily most of them have a browser-like viewing arrangement. And so we will start uh, with this feature they have in common, and this is what it looks like on my laptop if I create a new user, the user that I created here is called typical user, uh, and you can see the name there, you can see the name there, you can see the name there as well. And uh, this is what the file manager shows me of the typical user uh, just immediately after creation. So there are these uh, eight icons, these are eight subfolders in typical users system the moment they start up. So in my machine, these eight folders have already been created inside typical user, and so they are subfolders of the folder called typical user. So the top level folder in my system has the same name as the user, typical user, but on your system it might not be the same. So you need to check out exactly how it is. So take a moment for you to identify your top-level directory, that is the top-level directory in your user space, under your username. So it is really important to get this right. And if you're a real beginner on the computer, you really actually really need to make sure that you can do this. On a Windows system, you would use File Explorer. On iOS, uh, you would use Finder. And on Linux, you might use this one or another file manager and so on. Take another moment to compare your top-level directory with the graphic above. You may have something, a variety of differences, like a list of names rather than icons, no panel, um, and things like that. It may even be the full screen and not just a small part of the screen. But make sure that you can find the name of your current directory. So it appears, as I said, a couple of times here. Um, but the place that you really, on this particular system of mine, this is where you look. Uh, typical user sits under home. Okay. Um, now, what has happened here is that I've opened up the pictures folder itself. So here is pictures. I click on it or double click depending on your system or the other ways also to go there, which is a screenshot that I made of the previous screen. Okay, so uh, this long list pictures, typical user, home, that's known as the path. And we will refer from time to time up to the path of your particular subdirectory. And the crucial thing will be that you should know in which subdirectory your files for this course are 
and what the path is to it. Okay, now, if this is at all new to you, then please play with the folders and the files in your home directory. You should make sure that you can move away from the directory and back to it. You should make sure that you can add a subfolder with a name that you create. You should um, be able to create a document file inside the subfolder. You should be able to rename, rename the document file. You should be able to delete the document file. All of this inside the file manager. Um, you should be able even to delete the directory that you created and so on as you uh, go on. All of this is very important. And also make sure that if you gotten completely lost on your computer that you could use the file manager to get back to the directories you want. So go into a completely different directory if you can, not even under your own username, and then get back to your own personal user directory. So this is a really important moment and for a real beginner this is something that you really have to make sure that you really can do. Um, I would recommend that you create a folder dedicated to this course. You will store everything that you download, you will write code for this course, and in fact I would recommend that you at least create two subfolders, my code answers for the Julia code you write, and course materials for the course materials that you store. Of course these names are not uh, cast in stone, you can use exactly your own words or your own characters or however you want to name them. Okay, so that is the most important and tricky part of setting up your system for this course. So the next thing that we have to know about is how to write and save plain text files. And these are a little bit different from the documents that you normally make with a, a program like MS Word. Those programs like MS Word and Pages add a lot of information to the actual text that you type in. Um, there's all that formatting information that has to be stored with the file to make sure the file is correctly formatted. So all this extra information is fatal to Julia programs. You will see in this course that Julia can only work with programs that contain valid Julia code and nothing more. So all the formatting and all the other information that the document systems put in your .doc or your .docx or your .pdf file or whatever the other specialized formats are that you may be using, they are like poison to Julia. You have to insist that none of this extra information is in the file you save and that you will run. That is, the file that you use must be plain text files. So we will use a limited definition of plain text on this course. The Julia can actually accept things that are not on a standard international keyboard. We will briefly mention some of those things that you can enter. But by and large, we will make sure that the actual text we enter is text that can be entered directly from the international keyboard without any special tricks. Um, and I find it easiest to use a, a program like Mousepad or Notepad Plus, which can be set up so that it delivers a plain text file and nothing else. Um, in fact, for some of them, that's the only thing you can do with them. You cannot actually format it beyond plain text and you can then save it with the extension that you want. Um, if you want to use MS Word or LibreOffice or Pages, then you can create plain text files, but what happens is that they tend to give you the .txt extension when you first save the file. And then you have to go in by hand and change it because in Julia it should have the .jl extension. Okay, so practice this a bit. Uh, create some text files, plain text files. Make sure they're plain text files in whatever way you can. And, and, give, and change the extension from .txt to .jl or from any other extension if you like. Okay, so that's two of the three things. And the last thing that you need to be able to do is to launch the Julia repo. We of course assume that you have installed Julia on your computer. So just launch it and on your system, it may be done with a single click or a double click or there are even a way of typing in the command Julia and run it, it doesn't really matter. On my system, I entered the command Julia and then this is what I saw. So if you launch the REPL, you will see this logo for Julia and you will see some information here and you will then see this, which is the Julia prompt. And you can then type over there. If you can't immediately type in the window, it's because it's not an active window. You click on it 
or you make it an active window in other ways as well, and then you can type. And you type, 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 type some things, and you press enter, something happens, you may see it or you may not, and then the Julia prompt will come up again. And that is what you will do over and over in this course. You will add the Julia prompt, enter some code, and uh, Julia will execute the code after you press enter, and then once Julia is ready, it will give you another prompt and you can enter it again. There are situations where the prompt will never reappear because Julia has gone into an infinite loop, but if that happens, uh, there is a way of getting out, and in due course we will tell you what that is. Okay, and then to end the REPL se session, you simply press Control D, that's the control key on the keyboard, and then the D, it doesn't matter whether the D is uppercase or lowercase, so you can press Shift or not as you like. You can also type in EXIT, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, so you can do that. Um, and that is another way of doing it. We will not discuss this in great detail, but this is actually, in a sense, the first bit of Julia code that we have mentioned on this course. Okay, so now let's turn to some brief advice on how to do this course. So as we insist in lesson three of week one, Julia is a language, and the test of learning a language is using it to express yourself. In the case of computer programming, when you express yourself and you run your program, the computer will end up doing some things. It will create and display text, or it will make a drawing, or it will compute a lot of numbers. It can print things on paper, it can play sounds, and more things. So, um, the expression of you through your Julia language program is to make the computer do the stuff. The main point here is that you cannot ex learn to express yourself without practicing to express yourself. So the main item of advice is this, write lots of Julia expressions and see what happens when you try to run them. Don't worry about error messages. In fact, error messages are something you should make use of. You can, of course, ignore them, but you can also learn from them, and you can do all okay. kinds. Don't worry if you get error messages. Just make use of them. The next thing is that you should follow the lessons in the course. Uh, we strongly recommend that you do them in the sequence. Uh, lesson 1 of week 1, lesson 2 of week 1, all of the lessons of week 1 in sequence, then week 2, then week 3, and then week 4. But interrupt yourself. Try things out at the REPL. Also try to write some .jl files. Go over the things that you aren't sure of. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Express yourself. Try and modify. Don't just do the same thing over and over again. And remain active. Don't get stuck at any one point in the material. The exercises and the assessments are there to give you at least some things to do. But they are not meant to be the only things you do. You can do much more. Okay, so if you want to know about the course content before you commit yourself, here is a list of items. For people who have not done any programming, it will not make a lot of sense. And for people who have done programming, the interesting part is uh, that we do more than just debugging. We also discuss the way the rules of a computer language depend on formal logic. But we also stress that you don't need to know formal logic to learn how to program. Um, and this is actually enough for interesting projects in Julia, which is what happens in week four. This list leaves out a lot that is very special about the Julia language. We give one final lesson in week four in which we suggest ways for you to continue on your adventure in programming. We hope that you continue in Julia, but of course we cannot insist on it. So that's lesson zero, and let's get on with the course.